or the 4,700 <coughs> private landowners, which would include some of those agricultural properties. Um, oh, and I just wanted to mention, so 55% of our water use is residential. A lot of that residential use is from our older properties. There may, not, there may be toilets that are out there that still use three and a half gallons per flush. Um, that, those three and a half gallon per flush toilets stopped being produced in 1994, but there are workhorses. They may still be out there. Um, in the 70s, toilets used five gallons per flush. Today, they only use 1.28 um, or less. Um, and, and with like clothes washers, for example, older clothes washers that were built in the uh, late 90s, for example, they may use 35 to 50 gallons per cycle, and they are probably still some of those machines out there. Um, in comparison, new high-efficient front-loading Energy Star clothes washers only use about 12 to 18 gallons per cycle. So identifying where you can make uh, investments within your own home and your landscape can have a really big impact on our water supply. And, um, and we do actually have water supply kits that we can give you, and I actually brought a few. They're in the blank envelope by your food and water, which was not by design, but maybe it'll get your attention. The um, water, um, we have a water, water wise indoor survey kit. It has a procedure that you can follow. It's a really short manual about that you can actually figure out how much water some of your fixtures are using. And you fill out a little form in, at the end of it, send it in to us, and we'll send you some free faucet aerators or shower heads that are more efficient than what you already have within your home. And we have videos online to teach you how to do those procedures if um, the instructions are clear. Um, and I, I, I had talking points for this slide, but it really connects to we don't know how long the current, like how long droughts last, and we don't know when the next one's going to come. So a lot of our services are about valuing, valuing our water, uh, whether we have a ton of water in our aquifer four or we're in the middle of a long drought. One element that exacerbated the recent drought that we were in was not only the long duration and severity of the drought, it was also the long, it was very hot those years also. So not only did we get less rain and imported water, it was a lot hotter. And when it's a lot hotter, people use a lot more water in their landscapes and it has a direct impact on our water supply and for many of our feet. Um, I'm, I'm almost 32 and I think at least 26 of the years of my life were the hottest years on record. Um, and it might be more than that. So when I transition into the water conservation programs in a, in a minute, you know, I really want to emphasize to people that, you know, we have a lot of pressures and, and, and demands that are facing our water supply, and we really do have that power within ourselves and with our homes to make improvements, retrofits, and engage with our community, like you all are doing by coming to this talk. Um, and I, I hit a lot of these points, and I see some glazed eyes, so I think I'm going to skip over it. But real quick, um, this this was one of the wettest years on record we had this this uh, this last winter. Um, the second dry was 1977, which you all are familiar with. And even after, even as we were exiting the drought, we were still well below average up until this current winter and the preceding winter. So it had, it was a long duration, and with hot temperature, it's really hard to get past that. Uh, these figures are from April. Um, a few differences, the current rainfall ended at 17.4 inches in Santa Clara County, which was about 110% of average for the year, if I remember correctly. Um, and our reservoirs today are about 98% of average today. This colorful chart um, isn't just colorful, it also uh, illustrates our water shortage contingency plan. So when our aquifer goes to a certain storage level, we end up implementing certain reductions. So we, I don't recall if we were around here, I think we're towards the bottom of stage three at the height of the drought, and because of all the community's efforts to save water, that it had a relatively quick uh, improvement on the amount of water we have in the aquifer. And 
The, this year, we got our full 100% allocation from the Central Valley Water Project. That last happened in 2006, so it does not happen very often. 85% of our state water project allocation, uh, which is 85,000 acre feet. I haven't mentioned this, but we also have something called semi-tropic storage. So in Southern California, there's an aquifer that we refer to as semi-tropic, um, and we use it as almost a water bank. So if we get a lot of water one year, we will send some of, quote unquote, our water to the semi-tropic uh, semi storage that then in a low RUC year, we can say to our partners, hey, you can have X amount of water, and we're gonna take X amount of your water from conveyance instead of it getting transported further down south. Um, so it's it's more or less a thing. Yes. And it says put up to sixty thousand acre feet. So is that how much you can put in every year, or is that the total that storage in semi-tropic? Great question. I believe that is our total storage. There is more storage in that, but there are other agencies uh, and there's other agencies that have agreements in that in the semi-tropic. Yeah, I know, I know that we have like a certain allocation. I know there's only a certain amount we can put in every year, but I don't understand what up to seventy four percent of what. So that's up to 74% of 60,000 acre feet. And this is, it says up to because it's a continually increasing value. Because as water gets uh, delivered to us or imported to us from these projects, it ends up bypassing us and going out of semi-tropic so that we can withdraw it from a future year. So it's not a finite number currently. Yes, sir? What does uh, semi-tropic mean? So it's... I'm not sure if it has a specific meaning, but that's what we refer to an aquifer in Southern California where we have water sharing agreements with. So we, uh, we bank water in the semi-tropic basin that then uh, benefits us in a dry year because then we can import additional water in addition to our agreements because we have this agreement with the agencies that control semi-tropic that hey, you can use our you can use our water in semi-tropic if we take more from your imported because we did the reverse in a wet year for us. If that makes sense, um, I'm not sure if there's a specific meaning to the vernacular of semi-tropic. My apologies, but I have my card uh, by the resigning sheet. If you want to ask me, it's just a really it. bad name for a groundwater <laughs> basin. <laughs> so. Um, so as you all know, the, the governor declared the end to the drought emergency this year. Uh, we had record snowpack. Uh, only a couple years prior, that was when he went out to the Sierras and there's no snow out there for I think the first time ever. And, uh, but it wasn't as simple as just ending the executive order. The, the state is, really wants to make Cal water conservation a California way of life. So, some elements included, um, I think it's on this slide. So this is a document you can download. You can actually get all the information uh, on what plans are going forward. The most obvious to me, at least, is they've codified in state law uh, water use prohibitions. So um, don't wash off hard skates with potable water unless it's for health and safety reasons. Don't irrigate within 24 hours of rainfall. Those are all simple measures that are now statewide. And there's a few other to that. Um, and it also outlines additional, um, additional items that needs legislative action to take forward. So some of those actions may include additional requirements for agricultural water use plants that the water boards don't currently have. But they outline it in this document, and then now it's in the legis legislative process to try to actually codify some of that information uh, going forward. So um, other permanent landscape-related prohibitions, um, can't water landscapes that causes runoff. You're actually not supposed to irrigate ornamental turf on public street medians. So that is different than like a sports field or a playing field. This is those uh, medians that just have grass on them. They're, they tend to only be a couple feet wide. Those are extremely difficult to irrigate efficiently with uh, conventional sprinklers. And uh, if you have a fountain, it has to have a recirculating pump on it. Um, 
which sounds super simple, but it actually has a really big impact when you're talking about 30-some million people. And it happens to be one of the programs I manage. So I manage a water waste inspector program for the county. Uh, I'm going to be forthright with you guys. Not a lot of people know about it. A lot of people use it during the drought, but the number of reports that um, amount of participation has declined since our water supply has improved over time. But there's four really easy ways to report water waste. You can call 408-630-2000. Uh, you can send us an email. Or we have this really handy access value water app where you can report water waste that you see. You don't have to talk to anyone. You can just geotag the location, maybe just snap a photo with it so that my staff can actually investigate it, follow up with the property management, get them to actually fix the problem, and try to reach out to uh, those property management and landscape managers so they know about our programs that we offer. So this is connected to someone's earlier question about do we work with planning agencies. It's all about outreach, and this is an outreach tool that we have to make sure that as many people know about our programs as possible. How about um, like San Jose Water? Um, do you um, manage this program for San Jose Water? No. If great, I snap great a photo of something downtown San Jose where they're wasting water and send it to you guys, you just pass it on to San Jose Water Company? No, I like engaging with people and I like making sure that people are empowered by taking the effort to notify me of these issues. Um, I do let the water companies and municipalities know when an issue continues and I basically I have a database where I keep track of all the photos I get and reports. So I take an out educational outreach approach. Sometimes people are irrigating at times a day when they're not actually home and so they may not know it's an issue. So I you know I do that as a first step. If the problem continues or they don't care, then I say, hey San Jose Water Company, hey San Jose Municipal Water Services, this is an issue, here are the photos I have. Um, so I don't pass the buck. I really that's one reason why I got in the government is that I really love empowering people and trying to make them feel like efforts that they make has an impact. Um, and also trying to break down silos between agencies, and so I don't, I don't shield that information from those companies. I don't, but I don't pass the buck to them immediately either. Uh, the in January and throughout this year, the uh, the Water District Board of Directors wanted to keep our momentum for savings, so they actually instituted a twenty percent recommended reduction. The um, it, which included recommendations for certain water waste prohibitions. June or January to June of this year, even with just a 20% reduction uh, call, we save 26% cumulative. So there's still momentum for water savings relative to how much we're using in 2013, even though there's thousands of more people that live here. Um, and even though the attention on the drought is um, less. So, I talked about a lot of this stuff already, so I'm not going to repeat it, but saving water also saves energy. So when you think about saving water, you're also having a positive impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The largest energy consumer in the state of California is for the movement and treatment and transport of water. So even if you're not using hot water, there's still energy attached to having that water come out of your faucet or into your landscaping. So we have residential programs, landscape programs, commercial, industrial, institutional programs. Institutional is just a fancy, unfamiliar term for schools and parks and other government facilities, uh, and outreach and education. And I know it's getting late, so even though this is my favorite part of the talk, I'll do my best to give you very quick and clear information on it. So we have a water waste survey program. I did mention this earlier. So there is a kit. Uh, just past your water bottle, uh, the water pitcher over there. There's no actual equipment in that, but it is doing its best to empower you to figure out how much water you actually do use in your home, what you can upgrade, and we send you some of those free items, uh, some of those items for free when you return a form at the end of that kit. We also have a landscape beauty program. Not only is, does that convert turf to low water use plants, we have high high efficiency sprinkler nozzle rebates, dedicated irrigation meter rebates, uh, converting sprinklers to drip irrigation rebates, 
So you can keep your lawn, we're just trying to do our best to help you, you irrigate that lawn more efficiently. Yes, sir. Uh, you might want to think about uh, something that I see going on. At least uh, two of my neighbors who were pretty good in conserving water and cutting back and let, letting their lawn die. Um, now that they consider the drought over, they're putting their turf back. Um, and you know, I know I, I took advantage of your program and removed my turf, and at the time I had to have a living lawn. And in fact, I pumped a ton of water on my grass to get it healthy enough so that you guys would pay me to take it out. Uh, and, uh, but what I see is, I, I'm, perhaps if there's a lot of lawns out there that are dead now that people could be encouraged to put something else in there instead of putting their turf back if they could take advantage of some sort of rebate program. Or Great comment. And we actually recognize the uh, contradictory nature of that requirement and that's no longer the case. So you can have a dead lawn, we will still do a pre-inspection and we and you can get that lawn uh, replaced with a low RH plant. And then for your neighbors that, that want to keep their lawns, we have high efficiency sprinkler nozzles, or sometimes called uh, rotary sprinkler nozzles, um, and they use about 30% less water per minute. So they actually run a little bit longer, but they have a considerably less risk of creating runoff if you program them correctly in your irrigation controller. We also have rain sensor rebates, we have weather-based irrigation controller rebates so that it will automatically change how long you're irrigating your landscape based on the season and the climate at the time. And if it's raining, it won't irrigate your lawn. So we have incentives like that. And then we also have a gray water rebate program. Um, for the water ice survey kit, there's an indoor and an outdoor portion. If you're a San Jose Water Company customer, they actually have their own program, so we currently just forward people to San Jose Water Company. Um, there's a caveat where there is a larger program. I'm gonna see if it's on this side. So we have a, another program for a large landscape survey program. This is another program I manage. So um, it's for any landscape that's a half acre or bigger. Uh, where we actually do two things. Uh, if the water company participates, their um, dedicated sorry, sites with a dedicated landscape meter can get a monthly report that compares how much water they use to a specific site, site specific budget. Um, and also they are eligible for a free landscape survey that evaluates how efficiently and effectively they're irrigating their landscape and they get a report at the end. So we have a home version of it where we actually um, will go to any residential property and do something similar. And our technicians have over 40 years of combined experience working in the irrigation and landscape water management. So you get a huge bang for your buck, which is, it's free. Um, and again, we do provide recommendations for upgrades. The landscape rebate program, I'm gonna come back to that. Landscape rebate program, um, it does require a pre-inspection before you do the work and you have to apply. So there's two separate steps you have to do, but if you do the waterwise survey program or a large landscape program, that counts as a pre-inspection. So we don't do a bunch of back and forth. Um, I know we're out of time and I'm sure you have a few questions. So I'm just gonna talk about gray water as one of my closures. I'll do a quick cook through of the rest of the slides to see if I missed anything important. Uh, but anyone in Santa Clara County, any residential property in, Cal in Santa Clara County is eligible for it. Um, typically this is just single family and maybe duplexes because you have, it, it's not a, an effective type of gray water for common areas. Really you wanna keep it on your specific plot of land that you control. So typically that's single family homes. But if you're a private well owner, you can participate just the same. Uh, it's a $200 per installed system. It's $400 if you live in the city of Cupertino because we have an agreement with them. And really all you do is you install a mechanical switch at your washer line, and then you install a new piping that's parallel to your irrigation system so you don't tie it into anything. And you get $200 from us with a few um, additional factors that I can talk to you offline after the, the talk. Uh, there's no permit required for a laundry landscape system. So that is a big thing. 
So there's no permit required for these simple gray wire systems. If you end up tying in a bathroom sink or a shower, you do need a permit because you cut in a plumbing lines. Yes, Miss. Yes. Can this water be used to water plant fruit trees? Yeah, it's perfect for, well, it's very good for fruit trees, and I include fruit trees on my little infographic that I have. I do have copies of this um, over by my other materials at the edge of that table. So, laundry and landscape gray wire systems, they are great for fruit trees, they're great for large trees, large shrubs, uh, and even establishing drought tolerant plants. They are a little tricky though because they're extremely sustainable.